Hello and welcome to today's reading. I'm going to take my reading today from my book Henry III, the son of Magna Carta, which tells the story of this little known king. I'm going to read chapter three, which is entitled Saving England and actually comes from Henry III's minority and is a little bit more concerned with Sir William Marshall, uh, the most famous knight in medieval England. I couldn't resist really reading about William Marshall. Chapter three, Saving England. On John's death, Louis had been laying siege to Dover, where the castle had stoutly held out under Hubert de Burr, as the rest of the South East fell to the prince and the rebel barons. They held London, reaching as far west into Wiltshire as Marlborough, and holding control over most of Yorkshire, thanks to the northern barons. Royal resistance did stretch a long finger out from the west into the Midlands, with men loyal to John dug in at Windsor, Oxford, Buckingham, Hertford, Bedford, Cambridge, Northampton, Nottingham, Newark, Sleaford and Lincoln. In the east, they retained control of the castles at Pleshy, Colchester, Norwich and Orford in enemy territory, while Newcastle on Tyne and Durham also held out for the king. This cut the invaders and rebels into two, but also left the royalist stronghold sandwiched between foes scrambling for their castles. Oxford, Buckingham, Hertford, Bedford, Cambridge and Northampton all lay under the control of Falk de Brite, a man with no intention of turning on from his former master's cause. There was something of a stalemate. At Dover, Louis had been negotiating with Hubert for his surrender when John died. A channel of communication had been opened to allow Hubert to ask John for aid to avoid the fall of the castle, so news reached them promptly. Roger of Wendover records Louis telling Hubert, I will enrich you with great honours and you shall be the greatest among my councillors, if he would give up the castle. Hubert reportedly replied, If my lord is dead, he has sons and daughters who ought to succeed him, before asking that he be allowed to consult the others within the castle. His comrades agreed that he should refuse Louis's offer, lest by shamefully surrendering the place he should incur the mark of treason. This was no throwaway rejection. The garrison could expect little relief before a slow decline into starvation and probable death, yet they bravely held out to remain an important thorn in Louis's side. Warfare during the 12th and 13th centuries was heavily focused on control and besieging of castles, huge monuments to power and authority that could be used to dominate an area. Pitched battles were judged far too unpredictable and avoided at all costs, making up a tiny minority of any war effort. The growth of the tournament circuit on which William Marshall had made his name and fortune may make it seem like the practice arena for pitched battles but in truth, it served to reinforce the volatile nature of such encounters. William Marshall had risen from nowhere to be a rich and famous man. No great lord would seek to risk all he had on such a gamble, and even if a battle were won in the field, control of the castles would still be the truest test of power. In the face of Hubert's valiant defiance, Louis agreed to an extension of the truce, perhaps knowing he couldn't take Dover Castle quickly. It was this concession that had allowed Hubert to reach Gloucester and attend Henry's coronation and the subsequent discussions. It was an important act of resistance and chance attendance. Hubert was Justicia, a role that might be roughly equated to the modern position of Prime Minister that had been in place since the reign of Henry I. The Justicia frequently represented the King, acting as a regent when they were abroad, making them also a national equivalent to the local sheriff. Hubert had been King John's Chamberlain, and in 1215 had been appointed Justicia, replacing Peter de Roche and leaving no love lost between the two men. Hubert was of lowly origins, his family holding small parcels of land around Norfolk and Suffolk. De Roche had arrived in England from a knightly family in Poitou and become hugely wealthy as Bishop of Winchester, though his secular and military activities always drew criticism from ecclesiastical commentators. They appeared for the moment at least to have lain aside their differences and found common cause in King Henry. Hubert returned to Dover, resisting Louis's attentions. Hubert was not, however, entirely isolated at Dover. The Cinque Ports, Dover, Hastings, Hythe, Sandwich and Romney, had initially folded to Louis, but almost immediately returned to John, with a band of guerrilla warriors led by William of Cassingham, hiding within the Weald of Kent and terrorising French troops. Roger of Wendover wrote of this man, a certain youth, William by name, a fighter and a loyalist who despised those who were not, gathered a vast number of archers in the forests and waste places, all of them men of the region, and all the time they attacked and disrupted the enemy, 
and as a result of their intense resistance, many thousands of Frenchmen were slain. The combination of these intransigent nuisances caused Louis to leave Dover with a group of his soldiers to loosely maintain the siege in the hope of quicker victories elsewhere. On the 11th of November, as the Great Council of the Royalists sat down in Bristol to plan their revival, Louis arrived at Hartford Castle and began to bombard it with siege engines. One of Falk's men, Walter de Goddardville, put up stout resistance, but on the 6th of December, Marshall agreed to hand over Hartford and Berkhamsted Castle if the men within were allowed to leave safely and a general truce be put in place. Berkhamsted's constable seemed more than happy to continue his resistance. A letter had to be sent in Henry's name on the 20th of December before he would give up the castle. With the expiry of this truce, another was secured by the handover of Orford and Norwich, with a further peace bought by Cambridge and either Colchester or Pleshy. Serious peace negotiations were initiated in late January and Louis gathered his council at Cambridge and Marshall brought little Henry himself to Oxford. But it seems Louis' supporters scented blood and had little intention of granting the Royalists their peace. They laid siege to Headingham before a truce was agreed that saw the castle and either Colchester or Pleshy, whichever had not been surrendered in the third agreement, given over to Louis. Almost all of eastern England was now in Louis' hands without any serious effort on his part. The capitulations by the Royalists must have given him and the rebel barons heart, though an English fleet still caused him trouble from the Channel, blocking his reinforcements and harassing ports that he held. The new gains left Louis with more men to impose his authority effectively, and William of Coventry recorded that his allies were less than pleased when he announced to them in London that he intended to return to France to gather fresh troops. The English fleet made his route across the Channel less than easy, but by the end of February, Louis had sailed out of Dover and back to France, leaving his nephew, Angerard de Cousy, in command and with strict instructions to remain in London. The reality of William Marshall's manoeuvring is perhaps only easy to discern at the distance of intervening centuries and with the benefit of hindsight, neither being a luxury Louis possessed. The castles handed over by the Royalists were isolated outposts, surrounded by Louis's forces and well within his sphere of control. They were icons of power, but served no purpose other than to keep the Royalist soldiers cooped up and out of the real effort taking place. In handing them over to secure a truce, Marshall was able to gather all of his forces into one concentrated bulk while simultaneously stretching Louis's resources so thin that he had to leave the country to secure more men. It seems likely that Marshall's genius was to see the castles as pieces on a chessboard. He'd made tactical sacrifices in order to arrange his own pieces in precisely the way he wanted, and Louis had greedily snatched up the bait. Within a week, the other benefit of the tactic paid dividends. On the 5th of March, after an evening spent in the Marshal's company, two of the highest profile rebels were turning back to the Royalist cause. William's own son, known as young William Marshall, and his close friend, the King's half-uncle William Longsby, Earl of Salisbury, rode out from their meeting at Nepp to lay siege to Winchester in King Henry's name, while Marshall moved on to Farnham, taking it about a week later before joining his son and Salisbury. Marshall took over the siege at Winchester, where the town and Bishop's Castle had fallen, but the town castle still held out. Taking over from the younger men, Marshall sent them to roll west through Southampton, Odium and Marlborough, which fell only after a difficult siege. Philippe d'Aubigny took Porchester back into royal hands. Chichester was regained before the end of April. Falk de Breté added the Isle of Ely to this hall. These territories were carefully selected to extend the royal influence in a coherent block, rather than the former patchy network, whilst denying Louis access to ports on the south coast. The royalist regroupings and careful targeting of the rebels' resolve was working. Louis's decision to leave the country had proven a poor choice. In late April, Prince Louis finally returned with fresh troops to renew his efforts, but found the landscape significantly changed. News must have been reaching him in France of the setbacks, which may have hastened his return. As he sailed into Dover on the morning of the 23rd of April, St George's Day, he found the huts erected for the besieging force emptied of men. As he watched from the sea, a force led by one of John's illegitimate sons, Oliver, and the leader of the guerrilla force, William of Cassingham, who would become known as Willikin of the Weald, 
ran into the town and set ablaze the huts. Louis was forced to divert to Sandwich, uncertain of what he might sail into amid the smoke and confusion of Dover. The following day, Louis rode to Dover Priory to hear the full report of his losses. He immediately secured a further truce with Hubert and returned to Sandwich, which he had burned to the ground. On the 25th of April, he set out for Winchester, meeting several of his allies en route and arriving on the 27th of April, only to find that it had fallen to the Royalists. When news reached Marshall of Louis's return, he ordered the abandonment and destruction of all the castles they had retaken, with the sole exception of Farnham, which held out to distract the French. It was clear that Marshall's tactic left no room for lengthy sieges that would consume manpower. What he'd gained was expendable, and he perhaps meant to do no more than provoke Louis. On the 28th of April, the French prince was visited by the Earl of Winchester, who urgently requested men to relieve the siege one of his fortress at Montsorel. Winchester had received word from the garrison, pressed in for almost a month, that they would fall immediately without aid. Winchester petitioned Louis so passionately and relentlessly that he was sent back to London with the authority to raise men for the relief of Montsorel and the subdual of the rest of the region. On the 1st of May, this force marched out of London, but news of their approach ran ahead and by the time they reached Montsorel a few days later, the Royalist forces had withdrawn to Nottingham. This would fit with Marshall's apparent tactic of avoiding lengthy engagements that he lacked the men and money to maintain. In the meantime, Louis set about rebuilding the castle at Winchester that Marshall had slighted. Once he was satisfied work was underway, he left the Count of Nevers to see it completed and returned to London, where he was immediately met by news that the garrison within Dover had breached the truce and killed some of his men. On the 12th of May, Louis was outside Dover Castle once more, this time watching his trebuchet being erected to begin the pummeling of the walls. With Montserrat saved, the force that had headed north were able to respond to an urgent plea from Hugh of Arras to help him conclude the siege of Lincoln Castle, the last bastion of royalist resistance in the region. On the day that Louis arrived at Dover with his trebuchet, Marshall heard of the northern force's arrival at Lincoln whilst council was in session with Henry present at Northampton. His response, according to the history, was so swift and clear that it suggests his grand scheme had reached its end point. Hearken, loyal knights, and all ye who are in fealty to the king. For God's sake, hearken to me, for what I have to say deserves hearing. This day we bear the burden of arms to defend our fame, and for ourselves and our dear ones, our wives and children, and to keep ourselves and our land in safety, and to win great honour, and for the peace of Holy Church, which these men have wronged and ill-used, and to gain remission and pardon of all our sins. Take heed, then, that there is no backsliders amongst us. What Marshall proposed flew in the face of established military tactics, but he wouldn't be deterred from a full attack on the French and rebel forces gathered at Lincoln, a pitched battle, with all won or lost in the space of a few hours. It's likely that such a plan met with resistance because the history recounts that Marshall was required to make a further rousing plea. For God's sake, let us stake everything upon it. Remember that if we gain the victory, we shall increase our honour and preserve for ourselves and our posterity the freedom with which these men seek to take from us. We will keep it. God wills us to defend it. Therefore, every man must bestir himself at the utmost of his power, for the thing cannot be done else. There must be no gaps in our armed ranks, our advance upon the foe must be no mere threat, but we must fall upon them swiftly. God, of his mercy, has granted us the hour of vengeance upon those who have come hither to do ill to us. Let no man draw back. William seems to have failed to mention the fact that if they threw the dice and lost, it would be the end of the royalist cause and Henry's hopes for a future. Yet his assessment was probably correct. Louis had divided his forces into two, and they would never have a better chance to defeat them decisively than attacking one portion of his army whilst the other was far away and could be no help. The Royalists could gather their full force and, if they could crush half of Louis's troops, that left only the other half to face. The harsh reality was that Henry's government could not sustain the prolonged sieges of castles, the passing to and fro of border fortresses might persist for years, but the Royalists would run out of money and resources long before the rich Capetian prince did. In the turbulent atmosphere, the papacy might withdraw its support at any moment too. 
Right then, they had a chance of numerical equality, if not advantage, and the power of God's church on their side. It was too good a chance to miss, and all of Marshall's manoeuvring over the preceding months might have been aiming for precisely this situation. Louis had been overstretched by Marshall's concessions. He'd been forced to leave the country, giving men the window to return to their former allegiances, lost castles that the Royalists had slighted, and been forced to split his forces, drawn north to relieve a siege that was abandoned before their arrival, and placed temptingly close to Lincoln, which might have prevented an apparently easy target. With the agreement of the rest of the council, Marshall called a full muster of anyone loyal to Henry at Newark just three days later, on the 15th of May. 400 knights arrived at Newark, perhaps fewer than William might have wished for, but their number was swollen by 250 crossbowmen and a large number of men-at-arms. Marshall and his son were joined by Ranulph, Earl of Chester, the warrior bishop Peter de Roche, Fulk de Breté, two more earls and several of the key figures in the royalist camp. On the 19th of May, the host was ready to leave. Mass was heard and Guala repeated the specific excommunication of Louis and reaffirmed the crusading nature of their venture before taking the king to Nottingham to await the outcome of the risky action. The military competence of those championing Henry's cause was clear even in their approach to Lincoln, perhaps informed too by Peter de Roche's understanding of the area from his time attached to the cathedral. The Foss Way drove a straight line from Newark to Lincoln's south gate, but the north of the town was raised above the southern entrance, and an attack there would have been hampered by the need to cross the river with them at a narrow bridge and then fight uphill through the town. Instead, Marshall led the army in an arc that brought them to the northwestern side of the town, where the castle stood up against the town walls. Lincoln Castle had held out for so long through the sheer will of its castellan, Lady Nicola de la Haye. The death of Nicola's father, without a son, had left her hereditary castellan of Lincoln, and through two marriages she seems to have remained a strong presence. In 1191, Nicola's second husband, Gerard de Camville, left the town to support John in a dispute with King Richard's Chancellor, giving strict instructions that Nicola was in charge during his absence. When the Chancellor attacked the town, Nicola held the castle for more than a month before a truce was made. In 1216, before his death, John was apparently offered the keys to the castle by Nicola then probably reaching towards her mid-sixties and pleading that she was too old for the task, but John refused and asked her to stay in post. One of John's final acts was to appoint Nicola Sheriff of Lincolnshire, and although this may point to a lack of reliable candidates for the King by this point, it's more likely an acknowledgement of the unswerving loyalty of the redoubtable Lady Nicola. Now a genuine damsel in distress trapped within a castle by an evil invading army, Nicola's plight must have sung to Marshall's chivalric ideals. By the time the Royalist army arrived outside the walls, Lincoln Castle had withstood French and baronial attention for nearly three months. William sent his trusted nephew John Marshall forward to try and make contact with the castle garrison, but the Lieutenant Constable, Geoffrey de Serland, was already on his way out to report the state of the town to the approaching relief force. Peter de Roche then took it upon himself to make a daring reconnaissance of the town to look for a way in. He entered the castle through a postern gate in the town walls, presumably the same one used by Geoffrey, but perhaps already known to Peter, and scouted out a gate in the northwest corner above the castle, which he had probably seen was roughly blocked from the outside, but clear inside. Returning to the army, a plan was settled upon. Fulk de Breté led a detachment of crossbowmen into the castle by the postern gate and took up a position on the castle walls. From there, between the castle and the cathedral opposite, he could look down on the besieging force in their stone-throwing machines. Next, Ranulph demanded the honour of the first charge and was allowed to lead a force to attack the barred north gate in what must have been intended to be a distraction, as Marshall and his men began the heavy work of clearing the blockade at the northwest gate. As Ranulph attacked and the French force moved to the northern gates, Falk's men unleashed a deadly hail of quarrels into the crowd, causing shock and panic. Emboldened, Falk himself took a small group of men and charged from the castle's eastern gate, only to be quickly captured by the French and then freed again by his own men. In the confusion, Marshall's force was afforded the time they needed to clear the gate and gain entry to the town unnoticed. Advised to wait for Ranulph to lift his attack and rejoin the army so that they were at full strength, the 70-year-old Marshall couldn't be deterred from a charge 
though he was reined in by a valet who pointed out to the old knight that he'd forgotten to put his helmet on. Once properly armoured, he drove his steed fully three spear lengths into the enemy ranks and began to fight like a youth in a tournament circuit again. A tournay then being a wide-ranging mock battle rather than the formalised joust of the later medieval period. Caught by surprise, there was panic in the ranks of the besiegers. The history enthusiastically boasts that a hungry lion never rushed on its prey so hotly as Marshall on his foes. The Bishop of Winchester followed him, calling out, God help the Marshal, though the old knight seemed to need no assistance. Ranulf, at almost the same time, finally breached the northern gate. The dice were cast and the royalist cause hinged entirely on the next few hours of close quarter fighting. As the royalists poured in, they caught those inside the walls so by surprise that one man working a stone-throwing siege engine looked up from his work and assumed those crossing the open area were his own men. Turning back to his machine, he was about to fire when a royalist knight rode past him and cut his head from his body. One of the English rebels, Robert of Ropsley, levelled his lance at the Earl of Salisbury, Henry's half-uncle, and shattered it on him, only for William Marshall, riding at Salisbury's side, to deliver the man such a blow that he was knocked from his horse and crawled away to lick his wounds. The leader of the French forces, the 22-year-old Count of Perche, described in the history as a handsome, tall and noble-looking man, rallied men to him to try and hold the attackers while the rest of the force fell back. When he was finally surrounded and his surrender called for, the Count, according to Roger of Wendover, swore to them that he would never give in to men of a race who had been traitors to their king, perhaps identifying a cultural split within Louis's force that could never properly have healed. Indeed, many of the reversi cited the high-handed behaviour of the French as their reason for abandoning Louis. Reginald Croc, one of Falk's knights, then thrust his spear into the Count and caught his helmeted face, Marshall jumped down and took the reins of the Count's horse, concerned that he had been hurt, only for the Count to smash William on the head three times with his sword, denting the helmet he might not have been wearing, but for the vigilant valet. With that, the Count fell from his saddle. Presuming he had fainted, his helmet was removed, only to find that the spear had pierced his eye and gone into his brain. If the pitched battle were as a novelty, the death of a member of the nobility was a source of deep shock to all. High status combatants were taken as prisoners or ransomed. Only those not worth ransoming were fair game to kill. The French forces raced down the hill to follow their comrades, only to find them regrouped at the bottom and ready to push back up the hill. The attempt was short-lived though, and the French eventually routed. Their escape was hindered by the bridge over the Witham and by the odd mechanism on the gate that caused it to close behind each man so that the next had to dismount and reopen it. At one point, a cow managed to get itself wedged in the other side of the gate and blocked their passage until it was killed and dragged out of the way. Several French and a large portion of the rebel barons were taken prisoner and the fleeing army was pursued, though the history notes that family ties probably caused the chase to be less than committed as men decided against riding down their fleeing relatives. Only three Frenchmen of note and 200 knights made it back to London. The unfortunate men-at-arms abandoned to the vengeance of the folk of the countryside they passed through. Within Lincoln, only five men were reported as killed during the fighting, a testimony to the less bloodthirsty nature of battles entered by those who were more accustomed to the notion of a tournay. Indeed, what's now known as the Second Battle of Lincoln was quickly referred to as the Tournament of Lincoln, later translated as the Fair of Lincoln. Marshall's gamble had paid off, and apparently without waiting to eat or refresh himself, he rode directly to Nottingham to tell the king of their victory. Despite this, in his absence, the royalists sacked Lincoln and despoiled the whole city, even to the uttermost farthing, using Guala's orders to treat the canons there as excommunicates for their opposition to Henry as an excuse to loot churches. Women gathered up their children and took to small boats, trying to row to safety, but in their inexperience, many capsized and were drowned, their valuables washing up on the banks and being added to the booty. It was a disgraceful episode, and it must be suspected that it wouldn't have occurred had William Marshall stayed. To add insult to injury, Nicola de la Haye was removed as Sheriff of Castellan and her positions handed to the Earl of Salisbury, who further rode to Montsorel and took custody of it when news arrived that the French garrison there had also fled south. Nicola journeyed to the King in person to plead her case, 
he immediately gave her everything back, though a compromise was later agreed that gave Salisbury the position of sheriff and returned to Nicola the castle and town, though Salisbury also ensured his son would marry Nicola's granddaughter, her sole heiress. Monsorrel was given over to Ranulf, who had it torn down. The Royalist victory was as complete as it was shocking. At Nottingham, there was uncertainty as to the next move. Some wanted to march on London, others to meet Louis and relieve Dover. Marshall decided instead to allow everyone to take stock and a breath. He sent everyone home to secure their hostages and set another muster for a few days later. When news reached Louis on the 25th of May, he was equally shocked. After consulting with his councillors, he reluctantly had his trebuchet dismantled and returned to London on the 1st of June to regroup. Around 150 notable men flocked to Henry's cause over the weeks that followed Lincoln. The Royalists, then at Chertsey, made contact with London to try and tempt the city back to loyalty with the promise of a confirmation of its liberties to be given under royal seal, though the fate of Lincoln served to strike doubt and fear into the capital too. Louis ordered the city gates locked and a renewal of its oath of loyalty to him. The momentum of the conflict was now clearly with the royalist cause, and in early June the Archbishop of Tyre and the abbots of Citeaux, Clairvaux and Pontigny arrived in England, ostensibly to preach a new crusade. Instead, they set about the task of resolving the conflict in England, perhaps at the behest of Louis's father, Philip Augustus, who, according to the history, declared Louis's cause lost on hearing that Marshall had taken up young King Henry's cause. We shall take nothing from England now. That brave man's good sense will defend the land. Louis has lost it. Mark my words. When the marshal takes the matter in hand, we are undone. Several parleys took place between representatives of both sides, and a draft treaty was apparently discussed by Louis's chancellors. Negotiations fell apart when Louis, quite commendably, refused to agree to the exclusion of four clerics whom Guala would not readmit from their excommunication. Unwilling to abandon even these four, Louis refused to sign the deal. Caught within London, Louis began to resort to raiding outside the city for supplies, his men heading into East Anglia to steal the treasures of the Abbey of St Edmund. Louis's wife, Blanche of Castile, began to try and raise reinforcements within France and gather them at Calais, though English ships harassed and hampered the effort. By the end of June, the Earl of Warren had returned to the Loyalist fold and Henry and William Marshall called a council at Oxford for the 15th of July, by which time the Earl of Arundel was also back with Henry. A further meeting was summoned for the 6th of August, from which the royal host felt strong enough to divide. Guala and Henry moved towards London, while Marshall and Hubert de Burr made for the south coast to prepare for the threatened invasion by the gathering fleet. At Dover, Marshall called out the men and ships of the sink ports for a muster at Sandwich. The 70-year-old was desperate to join the fleet, but his comrades wouldn't allow it for fear of what would happen to their cause if he was captured or killed. Apparently Lincoln had frightened them as much as it had excited and reinvigorated William. Instead, the Justicia Hubert was given the command. As his cause began to disintegrate, Louis made one last bid to reverse his fortunes with the aid of a famous pirate, Eustace the Monk. Eustace had been employed by John at the outbreak of war, but had invaded and occupied the Channel Islands in 1205, to John's irritation. When Eustace began attacking English shipping in the Channel, he was outlawed by John and turned to the French side. On the 24th of August 1217, Eustace headed toward Dover with a fleet and an army from Calais. As they rose on the clear morning of the 24th of August, Marshall and the Royalists could see the fleet, consisting of around 80 ships, including 10 large warships, packed with some of France's finest knights and plenty of soldiers, looming in from Calais. The most notable men were to be found on the flagship with Eustace, who appeared to have control of the French Armada. The English had, at best estimate, half the number of available ships, and were disheartened by the sight of so many well-arrayed enemies. Many abandoned their ships for small boats, as though they intended to flee. With characteristic vigour, Marshall offered to join the sailors again, but his men told him once more that he shouldn't. Instead, he offered a rousing speech to remind them of their land-bound comrades' victory and that God was on their side until they found heart and went back to their posts. With the wind and tide against them, 
the English fleet moved out of harbour to pursue the French as they made for the Thames estuary. As they neared the French fleet, Hubert's lead ship suddenly veered off course and sped up. Those following copied the manoeuvre, which gave all but the appearance of avoiding and slipping past the French, who hurled abuse at the fleeing English. Whether those on shore panicked or were aware of what was going on is unclear, but the English sailors had used the cover of an apparent escape to get themselves into a better position to attack. With the wind behind them, they pulled alongside the French and launched powdered lime into the air, so thick that clouds blew across the French decks and blinded their crews into panic. Eustace's ship was boarded and captured, along with all of its prestigious crew and cargo, including fine horses and another trebuchet. The English ships up and down the line fired crossbows into the confused French crews and ploughed into the side of their ships with their ironclad prows. In utter disarray and with their flagship captured, the French desperately turned back for home, making for Calais with the English in hot pursuit. Only 15 of the 80-strong fleet made it home, the others captured or sunk. Eustace was found hiding below deck and dragged up to be summarily executed, though not before a sailor had recited his list of crimes to explain their refusal to accept his offer of 10,000 marks and service to King Henry in return for his life. Eustace's head was placed on a spear to let all know that the infamous pirate was really dead. Apparently heeding the warning of Lincoln, Marshall sent Philip d'Aubigny to relay the news of the victory to Henry and Guala while he remained behind and took control of distributing the huge amount of booty captured. The prisoners were sent to Dover Castle under Hubert's care and the treasure distributed fairly so that all men were pleased with their lot. With what was left, Marshall ordered the foundation of a hospital for the poor, named for the saint on whose day the victory had been granted, St Bartholomew. Louis had lost most of his English allies at Lincoln and now his reinforcements from France had been unable to reach him. He suffered two unexpected and crushing losses on land and sea and his cause must have appeared a tattered dream. To add to his immediate problems, Guala was outside London with the other half of the Royalist forces, coming as near as Kingston, though Henry seems to have been left at Windsor with his mother. There were fresh attempts at peace led by various parties, but still no agreement could be reached. According to the history, safe passage was given in Henry's name for one of Louis's men to travel to Marshall's camp at Rochester. The following day, that man acted as surety for the release of one of the captured French knights, who rode back to London, where Louis had moved into the tower for safety. Now Louis asked for a parley with William himself. Some demanded a siege of London, but many who had fought the French saw things the same way as Marshall. The only way to end the conflict was to get Louis out of England for good, whatever the cost. But they would help him to the utmost of their power with hearts and bodies and possessions. Marshall marched to join Guala's half of the force and ordered the fleet to blockade the Thames. Louis was faced with the stark reality of making terms quickly or being starved into imposed terms, which might be considerably harsher. When Louis met Marshall and Hubert, he asked them for their terms, assuring them that he would agree, provided only that they would not seek to dishonour him or his companions. It took several tense days for the negotiations to begin. When the Royalists sent their terms, Louis called a council of those within London and presented the offer to them. Roger of Wendover notes that this represented the only offer from the Royalists. They, with whom the whole matter rested, and who desired above all things to get rid of Louis, sent back to him a certain form of peace drawn up in writing, to which, if he consented, they would undertake to secure for him and his adherents a safe departure from England. If not, they would use their utmost efforts to compass his ruin. The terms were final, but temptingly fair. Lands and rights on both sides were to be restored to the position before Louis's invasion. All prisoners held by either side were to be released, though any ransoms already collected were to be kept. Any English subject who had been in rebellion were to give homage to Henry and renounce any allegiance to Louis, who was to release them all from any pledge. Louis was required to write to the brothers of Eustace the Monk, still occupying the Channel Islands, and order them to surrender the land. If they failed to do so, they were to be considered outside the peace this treaty would ensure. Louis was also to urge Llewellyn to give up his insurrection in Wales. To sweeten the deal further, all debts owed to Louis were still to be paid, and there was an offer of a payment to encourage his departure from England. Louis might have expected harsher terms, 
and hurried to accept the deal. On the 12th of September, the Royalists arrived at one side of the Thames near Kingston and the French on the other. Louis and his council rode to an island in the centre and were joined by the Queen, the Legate, Marshal, the Royalist Council and by King Henry himself. Louis and his men swore to respect the Church and the Pope and to uphold the treaty, Louis adding an apparently voluntary promise to convince his father to return Henry's lands in France. Henry, along with Guala and Marshal, then swore to return to the rebel barons what had been theirs before the war, and Marshal offered personal security for a payment of 10,000 marks to Louis when he left England. The absolution of Louis and his men was postponed until it could be arranged properly, not least because, according to the history, Guala, with his typical belligerence, refused to absolve Louis unless he arrived in the traditional dress of a penitent, barefoot and shirtless, clothed in a woollen gown. Though he did concede, after much pleading by Louis's men, that the prince should be allowed to wear a robe over his gown to protect his honour. It was done the next day, and in those that followed, the peace was repeatedly proclaimed and confirmed around the capital. Finally, on Michaelmas Eve, the 28th of September, 1217, Marshall watched as Louis sailed away from England. He would later be criticised for failing to exact harsher terms from Louis, but this is to miss the true crisis that Marshall was seeking to extricate Henry from. Starved of money and resources, it's astounding that Marshall was able to keep the royalist effort afloat for a year. That he was willing to risk the uncertainties of open battle at Lincoln and Sandwich is testament to the urgent need he saw to bring matters to a head, rather than engage in a prolonged and unaffordable campaign of siege warfare. If the handovers of castles were deliberate and meant to stretch Louis, it surely worked, and if it was only done to buy time, then it achieved that end too. Louis and the rebels were lured into dividing their forces in two, and then half was crushed. A victory on land and one at sea, neither assured by any means, won the war and saw Louis sail out of Henry's kingdom. That had been the mission, and it was achieved. Louis had shown himself willing to refuse if the peace infringed his dignity or excluded any of his followers. Marshall just needed to be sure that he was gone, even if it meant packing him off with bags of gold to see it done. Irrespective of later criticism, William Marshall had performed an act of heroic valour that would seal his reputation. He had saved a boy king, the Angevin throne, and fought off a French invasion that had been destined for success, all at the age of 70. He had won a war. There was only one remaining question. Could he win the peace? I hope you enjoyed that extract from Henry III, uh, although Henry was just a child at that point, and William Marshall was the man who really saved the day from a French invasion. I think it's a fascinating part history that's often overlooked. I'll hopefully be back again tomorrow with another reading for you. Thank you very much.